By the second day of the siege, the spectacle of armed Indians holding a town and 11 hostages had put the U.S. government on full alert. By this morning, the entire area was blocked off by police. There were roadblocks as far away as the Nebraska state line. On the far rise is roadblock one. We have further roadblocks around the perimeter, which encompasses approximately a 15-mile area. The director said, tell Trimbach he can have anything he wants, which was pretty neat because that was like a blank check. So I had agents go up to Rapid City and buy every rifle that they could find in the city because we needed them, like, right now. So they came down, and now we at least had rifles for protection instead of just sidearms. The military response is overwhelming. It involves plans using the U.S. Army to put down this rebellion. Clearly, there are people within the federal government who see a need to take it to the limit. I was awakened. There was a deep rumbling, droning noise. And we were looking around and we were surrounded by armored personnel carriers, APCs. All of a sudden we saw these two fighter jets come in and they circled around. And from the south they just came right at us. We thought it was over. That's Napalm. Dennis Banks pulled out his pistol and he started firing. Boom, 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 boom. Then they were gone. You know, it was that proverbial uh, last act of defiance. You know, here's that little mouse and here comes the big, huge eagle. And the little mouse is standing there like this. On the afternoon of the second day, South Dakota Senators George McGovern and James Abaresk arrived. They hoped that if they could resolve the issue of the hostages, the crisis at Wounded Knee could be ended quickly. When they came in, it was uh, very newsworthy. They came in with the news media. And that's how the networks got in. And uh, they said, we want to see the hostages. I thought it was a deterrent. The agreement I'd had with Russell Means was that if we landed at Pine Ridge, he would release the hostages. I have an indication through an intermediary that they will release part of the hostages. And I said, well, where are the hostages? We're supposed to release them. You agreed to release them. So they're standing over there. So I went over and I said, uh, you folks, we've, we've, we've rescued you. You're, you can leave now. But not right. anywhere. If you wanted yeah. to leave the uh, wounded knee area, could you go? They're sitting there on pins and needles. That's Trimbar. We had the people with them and said that they can leave. And Mrs. Gildersleeve, the matriarch. We're not hostages. We're going to remain here. It's your fault that these Indians are here. Have you listened to them? We're not leaving because you'll kill them if we leave. Once they realized no one was being held hostage, the senators hoped to persuade the protesters to stand down by offering to convene hearings on their concerns sometime in the future. We knew that a put off, a stalling tactic would happen once there was no threat to any other lives other than Indian lives. You are going to walk away from here and say, after a while, dok yellow, you know? And we're not going for dok anymore. We're not going for later anymore, Senator. I told you over the phone that I vet, and everybody here and down there have vet with their lives. Haim decided that their strategy would be to confront the government and try to win the public relations battle. Prior to that time, being a Mr. Nice Guy didn't really work with the government. They didn't give a damn. So that's the reason that Aim thought this was the way to do it. 250 armed U.S. personnel now surrounded the village of Wounded Knee. I felt good. This is why AIM was alive. This is why we came to be, to stand up against the FBI, stand up against the U.S. Marshals, stand up against goons, you know, tribal police. And inside, we've got freedom. Don't let nobody in.
Since its founding in 1968, the American Indian movement had been divisive, its militant tactics controversial even among native people. Created in Minneapolis by young urban Indians fed up with police harassment, the group had shown a knack for generating publicity. Members had seized high-profile symbols, Plymouth Rock, the Mayflower, Mount Rushmore, and in November 1972, had occupied and vandalized the Washington headquarters of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Weeks later, in early 1973, AIM took its campaign into the reservation border towns of South Dakota. In those days, there was a tremendous amount of racism, uh, especially in the border towns around the reservations. I mean, real racism, where Indians are practically invisible. There was towns you didn't drive through, didn't go through, especially women. You didn't walk down the street of any border town by yourself because you'd be accosted by any white man that felt like it. Just weeks before the occupation of Wounded Knee, a white man killed an Indian near Custer, South Dakota, 50 miles from Pine Ridge. When local officials charged him with manslaughter, not murder, 200 angry AIM protesters came to town. And you charge a white man, premeditated murder, you charge him with second degree manslaughter. And we ain't going for it anymore. And I know the whole damn town is an armed camp. Hey, listen, white man, I have had all the bullshit from your race as I can take. When police barred them from entering the courthouse, AIM members forced their way in. Just as we walked in through the door, then, then we were attacked by uh, law enforcement. We were fighting, and they come at me with a nightstick, so I blocked it and took it away and started using it on them. I know I was right on the steps, you know, and things were happening. We bloodied the, the guy, we took the helmet away, we bloodied him up. Then I ran across to help get gas from the filling station. We were filling up, making Molotov cocktails and busting the bottles on the building and the fire was destroyed on the wall and everything. Protesters set the courthouse ablaze and left Custer in shambles. There was absolutely an element in AIM that considered itself a revolutionary organization who were comfortable being around guns, who absolutely loved the idea of AIM being outlaws, who just wanted to get it on. The confrontation in Custer caught the attention of the Oglala dissidents on Pine Ridge. Three weeks later, when their campaign to impeach Dick Wilson failed, they asked AIM for help. Calling an AIM is attractive, but it's a roll of the dice. It's a roll of the dice because where AIM goes, chaos often follows, so that when those traditional chiefs bring in AIM, they're doing this in full knowledge that as they go down the road, they don't know exactly what's going to happen. The Oglalas had exhausted all legal options. They believed that to put an end to Wilson's harassment and intimidation, they needed what AIM could offer. AIM can bring bodies, they can bring people. They have the phone numbers of people at TV networks uh, who can get on airplanes and bring television cameras out. None of the established national Indian organizations can do what AIM does. The American Indian Movement's motto was anytime, anywhere, any place. And that was the most important job that we could do, is to be where there was injustice and to confront it. At a crowded community meeting, dissident Oglala's five traditional chiefs and AIM representatives finally arrived at a radical plan. Together, they would seize the town of Wounded Knee. They would force Dick Wilson from office and, for the first time in nearly a century, draw national attention to Indian concerns. The Oglala Nation is at a crossroads that 
that can change the course of history for any people all across the nation. And I would like to ask that the Chiefs listen very closely to what is being said here. There was this hesitation. No one could make a decision, and uh, no, one, no one would endorse us. And then the women started to talk. Ellen Moveskamp, a founder of the Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization, argued in favor of occupying Wounded Knee. This has been going on for a long time before we invited the American Indian Movement here. Because the people were scared, and they are scared of Dick Wilson and all his men. I don't see why all these people come from all over. I don't see why they they can't take him and throw him out or throw him in jail or something the way they terrorize the people here on the reservation. And I live in Pine Ridge at that gunpoint, but I'm not scared of them anymore. She was pushing. And she was pushing to, to spark something. And, and oh, it, it did. Finally, Fool's Crow, the oldest traditional chief present, spoke. Go ahead and do it, he said. Take your brothers from the American Indian movement and go to Wounded Knee and make your stand there. <laughs> 